Our guest speaker tonight is Paul Salamov. I will tell you after having just spent about an hour in his presence, he is utterly charming and has a passion for teaching and for learning. And with no more ado, Paul, come talk to us. It's all a facade. <laughs> um, thank you very much for having me. It, it means a lot. Uh, I get invited to lecture a lot at film schools, but to be asked here as a writer is very validating, and it means a lot to me. So a little bit about myself. Um, once again, my name is Paul Salamoff. I'm from uh, Massachusetts, a town called Natick, uh, which is one of the biggest sports communities of all of New England. And I don't like sports. I don't like sports at all, as a matter of fact. And that was very challenging, being a film geek uh, in a big sports community. Very early on, my, my parents had taken me to uh, a screening of Star Wars. I saw a double feature of Star Wars and Logan's Run at, uh, yeah, at the uh, Cape Cod Drive-In. And as my parents put it, my eyes bugged from my head. I was hooked. I was hooked on movies. I was hooked on science fiction and uh, just storytelling in general. Uh, I'm, I'm saying a lot of these things right now because, uh, I mean, I'm sure all of you understand as writers about callbacks and setting something up and paying it off later. All oh, this stuff's going to pay off later. You're going you're to love it. When I was 13 years old, my father took me to a convention in Boston, and I saw this guy there. His name's Tom Savini, and he was a makeup effects artist. And he brought all these props from the movies he worked on, and I, my, I just couldn't believe it. I'm like, this guy makes monsters for a living. And I remember I turned to my dad, and I'm like, that's what I want to do. I want to do that. Now, mind you, my grandfather and my father were both dentists, and my mother was a local politician. Okay, and here I am in Massachusetts saying, I want to make monsters for a living. Fortunately, my parents didn't lock me up. They were very supportive. And um, they really encouraged me to be creative and to explore those aspects. And they saw very early on that I was taking it seriously. So I, because I knew that, hey, obviously I'm not going to be able to do that in Massachusetts. I'm going to have to come out to California at some point. So at age 13, I really made a commitment to myself to make that happen. So I worked in a movie theater and I worked in a video store. And I would, you know, just make my friends up for Halloween and do lots of, you know, crazy stuff and, you know, put together this sort of portfolio. Well, as luck would have it, I did get into school. I did get into USC. And um, so I came out here in 1989 uh, to go to undergrad at USC. I really dug my claws in. I, I really, you know, I realized that, hey, I, you know, I wanted to be, I st wanted to be this effects artist. And I realized that, hey, there's all these kids making student films and there's not a lot of makeup effects people running around because all of them wanted like, you know, different blood and gut stuff or different, you know, different things. Um, so I started working on their student films. I happened to stumble across the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. And they were having a screening of some science fiction movie. And I'm like, I walked up to the door. I'm like, what's this? They go, oh, this is the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror Films. I don't know if you're familiar with the Saturn Awards. They're sort of like the Oscars of, of sci-fi, fantasy, and horror. And I'm like, there's this organization about this stuff. <laughs> and, you know, they've been already going for, I think, 18 years at that point or 20 years. And uh, I just said, I want to be involved with this. And I wound up becoming their, you know, um, youth president. Now, here's one of these callbacks. Um, the day I got named youth president, I was, uh, we were showing the remake of Night of the Living Dead, which was directed by Tom Savini. So on the day I got named youth president, I was there with one of my idols, which was just absolutely incredible for me. All these things were really, you know, keeping me going. And I decided my first summer uh, out in California to stay out and see. I talked to my parents. I'm like, hey, look, I want to stay out here and I want to see if I can actually get some work. Through some of the contacts I made at USC, I was able to get an interview at this effects company um, and went in there and just wowed the the boss so i got the job i was a runner i i did that for a couple of months but when i wasn't doing runs i was working on movies and i started they started trusting me more and really just started building my career as an effects artist so 
because I'm going to want to jump really forward because I want to get into the writing. <laughs> um, jump forward about, you know, a number of years, but I'd already worked on plenty of films. And a movie comes out in 1993. You might have seen it. It's a little movie about dinosaurs called Jurassic Park. And I went and saw it with a bunch of our effects friends and we're like, oh, we're screwed. <laughs> you know, it's over. It is completely over. So when I saw I sort of saw the writing on the wall and I said, you know what? It was never about being jaded. I mean, that's the one thing, please, don't ever, no matter how young or old you are, don't ever let yourself become jaded. And mind you, and I tell people, I've been kicked enough in the groin over my 25 years in this industry to be, you know, just completely spiteful and hateful about how this industry can treat you. But I'm not. I'm still very enthusiastic about it. I'm still extraordinarily optimistic about it. And every day is a new adventure. And I, it's, it's important because we do this because we love it. Don't ever let them take that away. Only you can take that away from yourself. I realized that I loved writing. I loved telling stories. And I loved movies. And the idea that if I was good enough, I could write a story, I could write something that could be made into a movie. That would be the ultimate. That would be the ultimate for me. So I put my mind to it. I, I had no idea how to write a screenplay. Um, luckily, I was working with um, at this effects shop, and the person who owned the shop was interested in writing too, and he had written one screenplay, and he said, well, why don't we write a script together? So we wrote this really, really bad script together. <laughs> <laughs> because that's everybody does that. Your first script is going to be terrible. Okay, um, and I remember this because it was funny. Um, when we first sat down to start writing, we were just like, you know, butting heads, butting heads. And he's like, "Look, you're driving me crazy. <laughs> he's like, you're driving me crazy. Read this book." And go away and read this book and come back and we'll talk. And it was Sid Field's The Screenplay. I don't know if you're familiar with Sid Field, but his book um, really is sort of like a roadmap to writing screenplays. But I always say this to people I, with this caveat. If you're going to read that book, which you should if you're interested in writing screenplays, read it, enjoy it, get the information from it, maybe even, even write a script using it as a guidebook. And then get rid of it. Give it to one of your friends. Just give it to somebody. Give it, donate it to a library. Give it to one of your friends. You don't ever need to focus on that. Because here's the essence of writing. Storytelling is storytelling. It's telling a compelling story that is going to keep the reader entertained. It's not about plot points or act breaks or midpoints or inciting incidents. It's about telling an interesting story. And I think you would all agree with me on that. You know, everybody loves to teach techniques, but there really is one technique. Tell a good story. So, so like I said, I wrote, we wrote the script with Jerry, and then Jerry and I wrote another script, another terrible script together. And then I said, well, let's see if I can write a terrible script on my own. So <laughs> I did. And it was terrible. But, you know, I was starting to realize that, hey, I'm enjoying the process. And I think I can do this. And I think if I continue with it, I can get better and better. Because that's it. Writers write, right? You know, the more you write, the better you're going to become, the better you flex those muscles in your, you know, in your hands and in your head. And then a really wonderful thing happened. Because I think we all know as writers, look, it's, you know, it's us in the page most of the time. And we don't get a lot of reaction to our work a lot of the time or a lot of satisfaction or even know if we're on the right course. Because it is writing in a vacuum. I mean, you could write something that you feel is, you know, genius, but until somebody sort of reads it and says, yeah, yeah, this is really good, <laughs> you know, you might be, uh, you know, fooling yourself. So... I was working on The Land of the Lost, and because I was a puppeteer, I had to read every script, and I was on set almost every day, so I really got to know the characters and know the world. So in the middle of the second season, you know, they were starting to gear up for the third season, and I came up with a great idea, or what I thought was a great idea, for an episode. So I went to the producers, and I said, hey, would you guys let me pitch you an episode? And they're like, sure, Paul. You know what I mean? It was very, you know, very pandering and very much, you know, like, we like you. Of course we'll let you pitch something. I mean, not really taking me serious. I, I, knew, I knew that they were just being nice to me and expecting me to turn in something really garbage. But they gave me the opportunity. 
Someone gives me the opportunity. Someone hands you an opportunity like that. You better give it, you know, 200%. So not only did I, instead of just writing a treatment, I actually wrote the entire episode uh, in exactly the same format as they write their scripts, as they write their teleplays. And I came up with ideas for nine more episodes that I put in a, you know, in a, in a really nice, you know, folder and, you know, very professionally done. And I handed it into them. Well, what do you know? They loved the script. They loved the script so much. They gave it to ABC. ABC approved it for the third season. They then canceled the show. (laughs) That sucked. (laughs) But, okay, but the point is, as much as devastating as that was for the show to get canceled, it was validation. Someone took me seriously as a writer. ABC approved my script. So maybe, maybe I was good at this. So that was all I needed. I mean, you know, as soon as you, because you got you to gotta learn to pick yourself up. And I mean, when someone, when something bad happens, you just got to learn to say, all right, What's next? How do I turn this into a good thing? So I, you know, really just, okay, I can do this. I can do this. I started writing more scripts. And then one of my friends who I met at USC got the opportunity to write a, uh, to direct a low budget horror movie. This movie was the dead hate the living. Okay. (laughs) And my friend Dave, who's the director of it, you know, he said, Hey, you know, I don't have time to really write this. Do you want to write do you want to write the script? I'm like, oh, yeah, absolutely. A zombie movie? Sure, that'd be great. Um, so I worked up a treatment, but then he decided at the he did, then decided that he did have time to write the screenplay. So he wound up writing the script, but I wrote the story. So I get story credit in it, and I actually play a zombie in the beginning of the movie. But it was, it was, you know, it was still like, okay, this is still the essence of my story. They changed some things, but it was still like, hey. I have a story credit now on a movie that got made and got released and actually kind of has kind of a cult following. Um, At the time, a little movie called The Blair Witch Project came out, okay? And Full Moon got the bright idea, well, we should make our own Blair Witch movie because obviously you can make it dirt cheap and make lots of money. So they wanted to hear pitches. Well, because I had worked with them on The Dead Hate the Living, they allowed me to come in and pitch, you know, uh, an idea for um, for Blair Witch ripoff. Um, so I came up with an idea that I thought was pretty good, and I went in and I pitched it to them, and they said, you know what? Yeah, we don't really like that idea, but we like you. We have an idea. If you think you can work with this idea, then we'd like to have you write it. Yes, that was the answer. I mean, I don't even need to hear the idea. <laughs> it's like, yes, whatever you give me, I will make work. So I got hired to write this movie, which became this film called The St. Francisville Experiment. Okay, so this is a low-budget movie. I think the budget was around $125,000. I mean, really nothing. But Trimark bought it for $3 million. Now, mind you, I didn't see any of that money. (laughs) But they bought it for $3 million. I'm going to release it theatrically. I'm like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? It's like, this is crazy. So it was in the trades. It was in variety. So I'm like, all right. I know the movie kind of sucks, okay? But it's not coming out theatrically for like six months or something. So I knew I need to strike before this movie comes out. So I got one of my scripts done as quickly as possible and I started looking for managers because it was in variety. So I had, so not only did I have like this new script, right? Um, I, I, what do you think I did? I sent out this new script to managers and agents with a copy of the article from Variety. Well, what do you know? I got a manager, okay? And so I got a manager because of it. And um, so I was like, all right, cool. And then, <laughs> so, you know, the movie's going to be coming out. It's like, all right, well, they're going to find out anyways. You know? <laughs> and then Lionsgate, you know, the, the house of Saw and all these big movies, they buy Trimark. So I'm like, oh my God, you know, now it's going to be a Lionsgate movie. It just went, you know, it just went up into the ranks of, you know, so now it's going to get a good release. Well, it turns out the Lionsgate decided to sweep four of their movies under the carpet, the St. Francisville Experiment being one of them, and it got released in Fresno and San Jose for like a week. <laughs>
and then into the obscurity. But actually, the funny thing is, it actually did like Dead Hate the Living. Kind of became a cult movie to the point where, and this is no joke. Two years ago, I got a call from some film festival in Texas who wanted my permission to show the movie. <laughs> at their like film festival and i'm like i have nothing to do with that i'm like you've seen the movie oh we love that movie and they're like okay <laughs> but you know it's all about this perception having success in this industry as a writer as a you know as a producer as whatever it's a lot about this sort of being at the right place at the right time, luck, I hate to say it, but luck has a lot to do with it. Um, it, it really does. And a, nine times out of 10, it's going to have nothing to do with the quality of your writing. I'm telling you, that I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room who are better writers than some of the you know, books on the bestsellers list. Why, out of all the YA things, was like Twilight a big deal? When there's probably a million vampire, you know, romance things. You know, why was Harry Potter? Why did that hit? When there's lots of boy wizards. You know, it's it's just sort of, a lot of times it's just happenstance or it's a fluke or it's just something grabs hold and grabs onto the zeitgeist, you know, and just goes for that ride. And, you know, sometimes it's well-deserved, sometimes maybe not so deserved. But... A lot of it just has, has to do with the, just the, the stars aligning. A number of years ago, I was producing the Saturn Awards, and I was in charge of the gift bags. We used to give out these great gift bags where we would give out like DVDs and comic books and books and like all these really cool like swag stuff, right? It was, um, and one of the things we gave out were these Ray Harryhausen comic books by this company called Blue Water. And um, I was like, wow, this is pretty darn cool, you know, that they do all this stuff. Well, you know, okay, I'm a producer on the Saturn Awards. They're giving us, Blue Water's giving us this stuff. Why not just give them a call? You know what I mean? Like, here's the time to do it, right? They're happy with us. So I called them up. Uh, I called up Darren Davis, who's the publisher. And, you know, I said, hey, just want to thank you again for giving us those comic books. I grabbed the Clash of the Titan or Wrath of the Titan ones. And, um, you know, I think your stuff's really great. And I'm like, you know, I'm a screenwriter. I've got a bunch of projects out. I go, are you looking for, you know, any writers? And, you know, he very politely told me, he goes, oh, sorry, we don't, you know, really do um, create, create our own properties. So I'm like, okay, I, it's, you know, no worries. You know, I, I just sort of, you know, didn't want to belabor it. And he goes, no, 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 hold on a second. But I am looking for a writer for, uh, for one of our projects. He goes, have you ever heard of, uh, do you know what Black Scorpion is? I'm like, is that that movie in the 50s with the big giant black scorpion? And he's like, no, 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 it's the Roger Corman one of the, like sort of the female Batman. He goes, well, we're looking for a writer on that. He goes, would you like to, would you like to pitch that? And I'm like, sure. <laughs> he's like, all right. And I just came up with the best version of black scorpion I could come up with. I, I just pitched him this idea and he goes, this is exactly what we're looking for. And he pitched it to Roger Corman and Roger Corman loved it. And I'm writing black scorpion. And then he calls me up and he's like, hey, we got this anthology series called Vincent Price Presents. Would you, we actually had one of the writers fall out. Do you want to write, you know, Vincent Price Presents? And I'm like, oh, hell yeah, because I'm a huge Vincent Price fan. And so I, there I am. I'm writing a Vincent Price while I'm writing, you know, Black Scorpion. So that goes well. He gives me another, you know, Vincent Price. Still, I write four issues of Black Scorpion. And then he calls me. And here's another one of those callbacks. Um, he, wait for it. Um, he calls me, he goes, Paul, uh, sit down. You're going to want to sit down for this. I'm like, okay. He goes, how would you like to write Logan's Run with William F. Nolan? I'm basically told that these are going to be based on the books, um, but I can really sort of reinvent it and rework it and do this, you know, this epic tale. And the first issue comes out and it gets like 20 across the board, like A plus reviews, like four star reviews. Ray Bradbury gave me a review. I mean, it was stunning. It was absolutely stunning. And, you know, that really started to get my career as a comic book writer going. And, 
you know, getting to work on something that I cared about so much and still care about. I mean, it's, it's such a wonderful feeling. How to write a good story. What I can tell you is this. If you're passionate about it, if you can't wait to put pen to paper or fingers to a keyboard, you've got something. If it's burning inside you, burning a hole in you and needing to get out, then you've got something there, okay? You've got something there. And I feel very lucky that I can write in lots of different genres. And trust me, I've been... I've had people try to pigeonhole me as a writer more than you can possibly imagine. Even having agents tell me that they won't go out with my comedy scripts because I'm a horror sci-fi guy and I'll confuse them. Meanwhile, I've optioned comedy scripts and I'm writing two comedy scripts right now for two big companies. Um, films. I mean, so it's, you know, even though I'm known as this horror guy. Um, to me... You never know where ideas come from, right? You never know where they come from. It could be just from something. I, I, I've gotten ideas from um, articles I've read. I've, I've written two scripts that were based off of articles I read that inspired me. Um, I've been just watching a really horrible movie and, and seeing that, oh, too bad the premise isn't this, and going, oh, that's kind of a cool premise, and then start exploring that idea um because i always try to do stuff a little left of center and i don't like to repeat like i'm because i watch so many movies which i'll get into um i don't want to make a movie that someone's made before i want to be original i want to have an original voice i want to do something that's going to wow people